Um, Commissioner Tierney, I, I do see you now. Uh, thank you for joining us. Really appreciate it. Um, one of the things that we're hoping to, and I, and I know you have a whole team with you from um, from the Department of Public Service. Um, just from a you know from a general context, appreciate your patience with my committee this morning. As this is the first, I think we've all been using uh, the Zoom platform in recent days. This is the first committee hearing we've conducted with this. Um, so again, appreciate your your patience as we kind of wade through conducting our business uh, via Zoom. Um, there are a variety of topics we'd be interested in hearing from uh, the department on in the, you know, in the wake of the governor's declaration of an emergency a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, two big areas clearly are how our telecommunications system and connectivity is, um, is performing uh, in the state right now. And I know that uh, folks from the department had testified yesterday with uh, the Senate Finance Committee um, on, on some similar topics. And then also um, how our ener energy infrastructure is functioning. Uh, one of the things that we've been paying attention to around the region and around the country is how uh, loads have changed uh, uh, across the country to some extent, but um, you know, interested at a, at a high level and generally how our um, energy system is functioning as a state just as um, you know our, our way of life has changed pretty significantly in the last uh, in the last week or two. Um, but with that, um, uh, I just want to welcome you and, and I know you're extremely busy and, and, and thanks for joining us today. Um, it's definitely our pleasure to be here, Tim. Can you confirm with a hand gesture that you can actually hear me? Yep. Great. Um, I cannot see myself on the screen, so I assume that I don't look completely ridiculous. You look and great. I, you look great. If I do look ridiculous, um, no worries. It really <laughs> shouldn't matter because the substance is um, the value that it has, regardless of how I look. Um, very briefly, to give you a fair warning, I've got two individuals on the phone or, uh, uh, who are appearing today who um, need to be elsewhere in fairly short order. That's um, Ed McNamara and Riley Allen. So I will ask that we put them on first with uh, what they have to tell you about how our electric uh, infrastructure is holding up and uh, the potential rate impacts and pricing impacts that you indicated an interest in hearing about. Uh, and then we'll go to the telecom piece. We also have with us, I think today, uh, Director Jordan, who is our electrical engineer, if anybody has any specific technical questions about the system. But in a nutshell, it seems to be doing fine right now. Um, I'm saying that because I want to offer reassurance. I don't think our infrastructure, whether on the electric or the telecom side, has ever been tested the way it's being tested right now. And um, from all indications I've seen, it's been holding up seamlessly. It's important to distinguish between that fact and our aspirations, what we wish our infrastructure could do. On the electric side, I don't see any wishes going unfulfilled at this time. On the broadband side and the cell side, obviously the story is different. But for right now, uh, in answer to your larger question, what has the department's focus been since the onset of the uh, state of emergency? Our focus has been first and foremost on continuity of essential service. And I think that has been going very well. Um, it has been on um, making sure that the utilities uh, have their contingency plans in place and an act are acting on them meaning that they are getting out there to do the necessary work that also fits within the parameters of the governor's uh, executive orders to ensure that the systems remain functional and delivering essential service to Vermonters while also planning for care of their workforce, whether it be in terms of prescribing and enforcing um, social distancing policies or um, in holding an appropriate amount of their workforce in reserve uh, to, in order to plan for the possibility that if their frontline folks get sick, that they have people they can rotate in. Uh, we have been discussing this a great deal in the healthcare space, but it is also a factor to be considered in the utility space. And that has been uh, one of several um, regulatory supervisory functions that the department's been exercising during this time. Um, very briefly on disconnections, uh, there are now disconnection moratoria in place for both uh, residential customers and um, non-residential customers. 
That is a process that was met uh, principally through voluntary action of the utilities, which in turn was then ratified through orders from the Public Utility Commission. So I think it's helpful for the legislature to keep in mind that there is a regulatory framework within which the uh, essential services that utilities deliver um, are being um, managed, reviewed, and acted on as needed in order to, to ensure that people have lights on and basic telecommunication services. So uh, unlike other areas of state government, uh, there is an already in place mechanism that allows us to do a lot of the reacting and prescribing that may need to be done under this emergency set of circumstances. There are some instances where there are uh, potential needs for either legislative fixes or executive orders, but they are at this time have not been absolutely pervasive. Um, the, the first point of uh, action has been either my reaching out to utilities and saying, hey, what can you do here? Hey, what are you doing here? Uh, get back to me on what your plan is for this, that, and the other and as necessary, going to the PUC for action. So with that introduction, um, I'd like to pass this on to Ed McNamara and Riley Allen, if that's all right with you. That's great. Um, June, I've got one real quick kind of high level um, yes. uh, question that, that probably goes across the, the, the uh, Department of Public Service function, which is, have you seen, to, to what extent have you seen um, an increase or none at all kind of in the consumer complaint world or issues raised by consumers um, on any front, but just more consumers are at home now. More people yes. are, whether it's yes. conducting business or quarantined at home. Has this that driven the, uh, any consumer complaint uh, increase? This or? is an area that we are keeping an eye on. I receive a report every evening from my consumer advocacy division on this. Uh, I have not seen a noticeable uptick in traffic when it comes to complaints. Um, they are well within the normal parameters, which would suggest to me not so much that people don't have complaints, but rather that uh, it's not necessarily the first thing on their minds right now. When we do get a complaint, it tends to be about service not being available, which as you know, is in the broadband space uh, of predicament because we don't have the jurisdiction over that, but we do nonetheless take in the complaints because we gather that information as a statistical base to help us with policy. But I can't say that there's been a, you know, a rush to complain. And uh, frankly, I'm not surprised because as I said, I think our, inf excuse me, our infrastructure is holding up very well, which is distinct from whether it is everything we want it to be. Does that make sense to you? It does, that's helpful, thank you. You're welcome. Great. So uh, we're gonna turn it over to Riley now. Uh, to Ed, if you wouldn't mind. Oh, okay, great, yeah, great. Ed, great, are you there? thanks. Yep, I'm here. Terrific. So, uh, so Ed McNamara, I'm planning director for the department. Just gonna give a very brief overview of what's happening on our- Ed, if you can get a little closer to your microphone, that, that would be helpful for me. I'm having a little trouble hearing, hearing you. Is that any better? Yeah, that's much better. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks. So I'm just going to give a overview of some of the regional impacts. Um, on a region-wide basis, ISO New England is seeing about a 3 to 5%. Lean in, Ed. <laughs> Sorry, it's not a particularly okay. useful computer here. That's um, all right. ISO New England is seeing about a 3 to 5% reduction in load in the last couple of weeks. This time of year, April, May tends to be relatively low load levels, um, usually during the winter and summer, the highest load. Also this time of year, you're seeing more hydro production as you're getting more of the snow melt. Uh, so you're seeing quite a bit of hydro production. Solar is just starting to ramp up this time of year as well. All those factors in addition to low natural gas prices are leading to very low wholesale market prices. And that has two different factors. First, during this time of year, when our utilities that have a lot of committed hydro resources and solar resources, those run of river or solar resources, the utility We're losing yet. Into the ISO New England market. And my apologies, uh, having trouble with interconnect over here. Or, okay. Um, so ISO New England, or sorry, utilities are selling into the ISO New England market. 
and they're selling at lower prices. This is sort of the worst time of year for utilities to be reselling power because wholesale prices are low and there's a lot of excess generation because of the hydro and the ramping up of solar. So there's a cost pressure on utilities because they're getting less revenues from the power they're selling into the ISO New England market. And I'm gonna turn it over to Riley to talk about the retail impacts associated with that. Good morning, Riley. Uh, good morning, can you hear me okay? I, I'm using a first set. Yep, you're coming through well and I'm getting thumbs up from other reps. Right, so. okay. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to uh, quickly cover a couple uh, points. Um, I want to talk about uh, kind of the retail ratepayer uh, exposure and uh, sort of building on Ed's comments. Uh, from our perspective, uh, we think the uh, exposure really emanates from uh, uh, three uh, or four things. Uh, first is kind of the, the lost margins, if you will, from uh, the difference between retail revenue and uh, wholesale costs to our, our utilities. Um, we estimate that it's approximately in the area of about 10 cent per kilowatt hour uh, that is lost uh, from uh, reduced sales that uh, Ed was referring to. There are also other areas of um, essentially pressure on the utilities. Uh, it uh, comes from uh, the resale uh, point that Ed had made. It also relates to uh, the potential resale of, of REC. Some of our utilities are relatively rich in the attributes of renewable energy, and uh, that's, that's being felt uh, as well because of the lower prices on the, uh, the, the renewable energy uh, credits. There's also potential uh, cash flow implications from the uh, disconnect of policy. But just to, just to give you a sense, a high level sense of what it is that we're talking about in terms of uh, rate payer exposure, on a statewide basis, we uh, the state has uh, an electric bill of roughly eight, $800 million uh, annually, or roughly $67 million on a monthly basis. Um, what we're seeing in Vermont is, uh, at least in, in March, was a 10% drop in electricity sales. Uh, uh, now, not, not all of that is associated with the uh, challenges that are presented by the COVID-19 and, and related directives. Uh, much of that is just weather related. Uh, Heating degree days are down about uh, 20% in the month of March. So uh, that's, that's a fairly major influence. The other uh, a secondary influence is uh, the um, effect of um, all the new renewable uh, distributed generation that's come on in the last year. We've had almost 60 megawatts of additional generation but at the end of the day, it's about a 10% drop uh, in, in March from uh, electricity sales. And I just thought I would uh, kind of share the, <clears throat> you know, the implications of that is roughly a five, four to $5 million a, a month relative to essentially a $67 uh, million a, a month electricity bill uh, overall. So that, that'll give you a sense of proportion. As uh, the longer, uh, the more months that go by with lower loads, uh, if they continue to kind of uh, float at a, about a 10% reduction, you can see roughly four to $5 million in essentially uh, lost margins by, from our utilities. And again, some of that you ascribed to weather and some of it you described to reduce demand just from lowered commercial activity. Yes, exactly. Uh, thanks. Um, so uh, I, I just thought I'd close by talking about kind of the, the recourse, uh, the regulatory uh, process and how it kind of functions uh, when our utilities are financially strained. Uh, there are a number of recourses for our, our utilities. Uh, for a largest utility, they have a, a decoupling mechanism in place. So there's a, a place for 
uh, it to essentially recapture uh, lost uh, revenues and, and um, associated margins in uh, the framework of its power cost adjuster. So on a quarterly, quarterly basis, uh, there is a, a mechanism in place to essentially flow back that uh, those lost margins. And they can be kind of spread and uh, adjusted so that the impacts aren't, uh, aren't too uh, great in any given quarter. Uh, the rest of our utilities have, uh, uh, have the rate making uh, uh, mechanisms that are in place. There is essentially a 45 day rule that requires our utilities to give notice, but they can essentially file for rates and put rates into effect uh, subject to refund uh, within 45 days of uh, providing notice. And that applies to all the co-ops and uh, municipal utilities. There are uh, various uh, other kind of mechanisms that, that we can kind of speak to, but I think that at a high level, uh, I th our thinking now is that uh, the regulatory mechanisms in place are flexible and will uh, essentially be responsive to to the, uh, the needs of uh, our utilities as they unfold. I guess the, um, the only, the last point that I would make is uh, uh, that the federal, um, uh, the federal Relief Act also provide, makes additional provisions for emergency relief uh, related to the COVID-19 uh, uh, epidemic. And so, there's some potential relief, additional relief for our cooperative utilities that rely on our US funding. I'll stop there. Okay, um, we, we've got one hand up, uh, Riley. Um, uh, Scott, did you have a question? We've got to unmute you, there you go. There we go. <clears throat> Hi, Riley. Hi. <clears throat> Excuse me, my voice is terrible. I've been sick for the last week. Um, so uh, you were talking about um, <clears throat> Sorry, lost margin due to reduced sales, um, and I guess I, you're, you're, you're kind of using uh, economists speak, and I just want, wonder if you can explain a little bit more what you're, what you're talking about. A four or five million dollar reduction in sales means uh, presumably some reduction in 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 um, in. I think. I mean, I guess I'm thinking of margin as the difference between between uh, between revenue and and costs. Right. Uh, and um, so I'm, I'm wondering, So if if they, if we have a reduction of sales of say five million dollars, and there's that's not a reduction in in um, profit. What? Yeah. Well, whatever whatever the word is for for uh, revenue over over costs for for nonprofit. Yeah. Right. Um, so I just wanted you to explain that a little bit more. Sure, uh, I appreciate the question and I apologize for reverting to uh, my uh, eco speak. Um, <clears throat> so what I mean is, so there's around $67 million a month uh, is our electricity bill. That's about 10% uh, reduction is uh, 6.7 million in kind of gross revenue uh, reduction. Uh, but part of that is associated with the cost of providing the electricity. And there's a kind of a relatively short run cost, marginal cost that is associated with that. And that's about, you know, in the neighborhood of six cents per, per kilowatt hour. So on a roughly 16 cent per kilowatt hour revenue, uh, the incremental or short run incremental cost associated with each kilowatt hour is about six cents. So in between those two is, is that, that margin, that contribution that helps to carry the costs of the system, the uh, joint common embedded costs of uh, our utility, some of the longer run cost considerations that aren't so caught up in the, uh, the cash flow concerns. So 16 cent revenue, think 16 cent revenue, six cent uh, incremental or avoidable costs, and then there is a differential of roughly uh, 10 cent per kilowatt hour, and that's being felt um, by our utilities uh, as they go forward. And that's the, you know, when you do the math, simple math, it's uh, roughly four to five million dollars of margin, if you will, that's lost per, per month that has, you know, real puts real pressure on our utilities. Okay, thank you. Riley, I've got another hand up from Representative Yantachka. Yes. 
Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, <laughs> this always happens. Um, my mind goes blank. Um, <laughs> geez. We can well, come back to you, Mike. Yeah, please get back to me. I'll remember. Robin, did you have a question as well? You got to unmute yourself, Robin. Maybe. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I did, and I I lost my hand raise hand button somewhere. So um, the old fashioned way, old style. Yeah. Um, so uh, Riley, I think building on on Scott's question, um, you talked about a, a loss in revenue for utilities selling electricity into ISO New England. Is that correct? Uh, selling electricity to other utilities. Other uh, utilities. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm I'm wondering. I mean, that works both ways, right? That electricity costs are then lower for utilities purchasing power. Yeah. How does that figure into the numbers you were giving us, the sixty-seven million or ten percent? I wasn't incorporating that. I was kind of leaving that out because uh, a lot of this uh, is just unknown to me at, at this point. It really depends. Some of our utilities, most of our utilities, are hedged relative to. Other, other states in, in the region. It's, it's partly because we have vertically integrated utilities and they uh, engage in longer term contracts and own generation where in other states they're restructured and they don't necessarily hold those uh, positions. So in the springtime in April, for example, there's a lot of, uh, well, there's hydro. We have you know the Hydro-Quebec uh, generation, but we also have you know, a material number of kind of run of river uh, hydro facilities that tend to run very well in, in the spring. I and mean, that's, that's when we get the runoff and that's when we have uh, just a lot of electricity being produced by our electric utilities. Uh, that's uh, <clears throat> typically when we tend to see, uh, you know, more electricity flowing than, uh, than we necessarily need and uh, that's when we're in a position to essentially sell some of that electricity to, to our neighbors. So it's in part a function of the, uh, the regulatory environment that we have here and part a function of the types of resources that we have, but it doesn't, that was separate and apart from the, uh, the math that I had done uh, earlier. That math earlier was just on the question of lost margins and I haven't factored in the implications of, um, of, of the question you're asking about, which is the, the, those resales. Okay, you also made a, a passing comment to, if I got it right with my hen scratch, um, there are revenue impacts due to disconnect with policy. All right, so disconnect uh, policy, those are just kind of the, uh, the, I mean, this is extending essentially that there's there's a kind of a wintertime moratorium on uh, disconnects uh, to protect uh, consumers that ends um, that ended yesterday, effectively at the end of uh, March, and that's been extended uh, by virtue of essentially the voluntary interventions of the utilities, uh, coupled with uh, the. Uh, order from the, the commission. Uh, that means that the leverage that utilities have to put customers on notice that there is going to be a disconnect and uh, um, the, uh, you know, they lose that leverage. And so uh, there is a, you know, a cash flow concern that would be associated with uh, the, um, the slow payment, slower payments uh, that ensue from uh, the absence of that that leverage. Uh, so I, I, I misunderstood the comment. I, I heard it as a disconnect with, from policy as opposed to a disconnect policy. Okay. So thank you. Um, uh, Mike, did you have a question? Yes. Um, and I have to remember to write these things down when they pop into my head. Uh, the, the question I had is, uh, uh, does can the utilities expect any help from the federal government in terms of lost revenues? Or, or are they a different category than other businesses? So uh, part, part of my response is, uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I just, uh, they've just uh, uh, created this um, uh, Federal CARES Act. I think it was signed into law 
Uh, and I know that there is relief that is uh, expressly uh, given to the cooperative utilities uh, in relation to kind of COVID-19 related costs. I don't know if that includes lost revenues or, or not. Um, uh, I know there are also uh, various provisions of the Federal CARES Act that relates to state and municipal government. And, uh, you know, again, that's an area that is unfolding. And it's not clear to me that lost revenues would necessarily uh, be covered by that. So it's, uh, it's it, you know, I guess my earlier point was we, we feel that we have the mechanisms in place uh, through the regulatory um, uh, structure that, that we have to provide some uh, relief. Um, and I know that June has her hand up as well, so I'll let her kind of jump in. So if that's okay. Please. Uh, Okay, oh. just to point out um, everything Riley said, uh, I agree with completely. Another thing to consider is that there's no um, legal bar to there being federal help if the Congress chooses to adopt that. But more importantly, the Congress may choose to afford ratepayers relief. And then that secondarily is helpful to the utilities. For instance, if a ratepayer accrues a significant arrearage because um, they haven't been paying their bill, um, the federal government may choose to grant help to individuals much as they're doing with the $1,200 checks. And then if that proves to be the resource that allows the ratepayer to pay off the arrearage, that inures to the benefit of the utility. That's all I wanted to point out. Right, that's so, helpful. Thank so you, Jim. A, follow a follow up there, if I may. Um, since the utilities are regulated, um, and they're guaranteed a certain return on investment. Um, does that mean that if they have a loss of revenues, that the rates that would tend to uh, cause a rate increase? Um, so that is, um, I mean, that's a complicated uh, question, but uh, the it, it varies by the utility uh, system. Uh, I never characterized it as a guaranteed rate of return, just just for. Uh, say for clarity, it's, it's an opportunity to earn a, f a fair uh, re return. But the, the plan that we have in place for essentially three quarters of the state through Green Mountain Power essentially is a decoupling plan. So a, a decoupling plan is intended to help kind of reduce the motivation, financial motivation to sell more uh, electricity and, and take that off the table. And that's uh, Part of the power cost adjustment plan that exists within the Green Mountain Power uh, framework. So within that framework, there is a mechanism that looks at the volume of sales and adjusts for the volume of sales and ensuring that the uh, utility has kind of fairly been given an, an opportunity to recover, you know, those lost revenues and lost margins, along with other kind of uh, variables related to power costs. Uh, now, with respect to co-ops and, and munis, uh, there is a, a, a more is inherently a sh kind of a shorter trigger for uh, kind of responsiveness. That is, to the extent that they feel like they're heading into rough waters, they all they have to do is provide 45-day notice of the need uh, for rate relief and they those rates can go into effect. They can also have those rules, even the 45 day rule waived uh, uh, if, uh, if granted by the commission, then they can kind of move forward even, even more quickly. But there are opportunities for fairly quick uh, responses for the cooperatives and the municipals for the uh, investor-owned utilities, there is a kind of an inherent decoupling me mechanism that provides, uh, you know, substantial relief in this area. Okay. So, Riley, I, I want to be respectful of your time, and, and Ed as well. I know that you guys have other things to head to today. Something that I want to bookmark that, um, e e frankly, even if we had our entire hearing to talk about this today, it might not be enough time, but um, I am interested in, say, a month from now, maybe even sooner, hearing back from the department as to what type of rate impact uh, you might start to see coming out of 
um, you know, what, what may be a blip uh, in, in uh, load um, in our system or might be something that's more prolonged uh, depending on how things evolve with this public health emergency in the next year or in the next month, hopefully not next year. Um, but I, I'm interested in feedback from the department as to, um, you know, some of the conversation we've started here as to what are the rate impacts going to be. And also, um, this may not be relevant or it may be, but we've got, you know, 15 to 20 uh, 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 electric utilities in our state. And are there any that are particularly severely affected by, um, you know, some of the issues that, you um, uh, th that are related to demand changes. And again, maybe that won't become more obvious until we've got some more weeks under our belt of what is actually occurring here in terms of uh, load changes. So. Uh, yeah, happy to provide more information and uh, suspect that the answer will be a hedge. I think we'll have a better sense of what the kind of uh, dollar implications are. And then it's a matter of kind of, uh, uh, the art of regulation to kind of figure out how to kind of smooth those uh, those yep. uh, rate implications in, um, but we'll uh, we'll have more to say about that later. June has her hand up too. Yep, go ahead, June. Just to reinforce that point, um, the committee should be aware that there is already one uh, action that was taken through the PUC process to defer rate changes that otherwise would have happened today. Yep. So one concern that the department has been keeping an eye on is with those decisions having been made and with those bills coming due conceivably in July, we already know that there is going to be some um, rate adjustment process necessary. Uh, there's a, a second utility that is in the process of uh, weighing um, a deferral of that nature as well. Um, so I'm just flagging that for you by way of example that uh, this issue is already um, in the, the thought process, the sorting hat, if you will, of the regulatory uh, framework and something that we are attending to. And so we'll be happy to brief you on that. Right. And, and, and again, and, and this discussion is getting along a little long in the tooth in terms of the time that you have and the time that we have. Um, you know, a question, a, a very general question I have there as the kind of pressure builds behind the dam on this is um, uh, will that will that more affect utilities financial health or will it more impact um, uh, ratepayers in the state of Vermont's uh, financial health and and I'm sure it's going to split be you know be split between the two but there will be an impact here um, as we no defer. Question as we defer these these rate changes. So no, again, no that's, question. Some, that, that's something that I, I, I'd like to bookmark to catch up on um, uh, as we get into April. In your bookmark, yeah. it would be helpful if you kept in mind the analogy to storms. You might think of this as a very, very severe storm, but the regulatory process has mechanisms for dealing with storms and the cost consequences of coming back from storms. And with yeah. that, I will take your cue and um, let you move on. Okay. Well, um, since you're orchestrating your team here, uh, Commissioner, um, I'm presuming the next um, person to introduce would be uh, Clay Purvis um, to, to talk about the telecommunications and connectivity side of the house. That, that is correct. And to the extent that there are uh, different questions, Clay may pitch some of them back to me. So I'll be on standby for that. But uh, okay, great. right now we'll have Clay step up. Great, Clay, I can't see you, but you may be on the line. I am on the line, hold on just one second. See if this works. Can you see me okay? Somebody can, but I can't. <laughs> oh, there you are, okay, good, thanks. Okay. Hi, how are you? I'm well, thanks, thank you for joining us. Great, thank you. Um, so thank you for having me uh, testify today. Uh, for the record, I'm Clay Purvis, the Director for uh, Telecommunications and Connectivity with the uh, Department of Public Service. Um, I'll uh, just uh, preface some of my, uh, or my testimony um, with uh, an update on uh, what, um, what has occurred um, both in the industry and at the Department of Public Service um, since the, the start of the pandemic. And I think 
March 13th is probably the, the date where uh, uh, things started to happen. Uh, Industry-wide, um, the pandemic is not something that affects the industry like it's affected other industries. Um, our telecommunication systems are all still working. Um, in fact, we are, as we sit here today on Zoom, um, we are relying on them more than we ever have before. Um, carriers uh, have, through the FCC, made various commitments to um, do things like suspend disconnections of internet and phone service, um, waive data caps, uh, increase bandwidth for their consumers where they can, um, and some of the carriers have also uh, opened up Wi-Fi hotspots. So carriers like Comcast and Charter um, you, uh, have allowed non-customers to access their customers' modems to use the internet. So if your neighbor is a Comcast customer, you can use um, Comcast service for free. Um, they've all rolled out uh, plans um, that uh, either offer uh, short-term um, uh, service at a low or no cost um, so that uh, folks with school-aged children can sign up if, if they need to, um, to do things like schoolwork or telework. Um, so we're seeing a lot of that. Um, all of these things are happening in Vermont, just like they're happening elsewhere. Um, a question we're, we're getting a lot is, is uh, with the increased traffic on these networks, um, is it gonna break the internet? Uh, the answer is no, that's not something that's happened yet. Uh, carriers are reporting increased traffic We've reached out to uh, all of the major carriers. They say that they have the capacity to handle the type of traffic that they're seeing. They are seeing more, uh, longer peaks. They're seeing a change in uh, peak usage, the time of day, in other words. Um, but they are built to handle that. And um, given that many of them are doing things like waiving data caps and increasing bandwidth, um, that is uh, that, that's something that indicates to me that they have the capacity to uh, handle the traffic that they're seeing. Clay, I'm, I'm gonna ask you to hold on for just a second and um, I'm gonna give you a chance to catch your breath. Uh, Representative Sebelia has a question. Laura? Thank you. Uh, good morning, Clay. So I just wanted to, um, with regard to, um, the notion of the increased traffic not going to break the internet, um, that is a relief. Um, but I think I just wanna make sure that we're clear um, <clears throat> when we're thinking about folks that have like a 4-1 or a 5-1 or a 7-1 connection who are now trying to um, participate remotely from the legislature and, um, you know, uh, do, education remotely from high school and work on uh, a job uh, somewhere else that we may be seeing that not functioning well or, is, or are we not hearing about that? So lower speeds, higher we demand, are, my question. We are definitely hearing about it. I, I must admit that my connection is a 4-1 and my children are uh, preoccupied watching a Netflix documentary right now. So if I seem pixelated, that's why, but from what I'm seeing, I, I look fairly clear. I do think you can do some amount of work on a 401 connection um, because I've been doing it and um, I know others who have, uh, but depending on the type of work that you're doing, it, it of course may not be adequate. Um, and so, you know, we have 23, 24% of the building locations in Vermont where, uh, 4-1 may be all that's available. Uh, it's something less than 25-3, which is the federal definition, um, and it may only be 4-1. So I didn't want to, you know, happy to hear um, continued reporting. I just wanted to kind of stick a pin there that 
while the overall network, it's I think a relief to hear that that's holding up, um, the increased residential uses um, in places that can't access uh, higher speeds, um, it's not necessarily smooth sailing, which I, I'm sure I know you are experiencing as am I, so. Yes. Um, yeah, I uh, understood that that's, that's been a longstanding problem. It's a problem that we've, um, we've been trying to address uh, well before the pandemic. And um, I, do, I do think that the, the risk of sounding callous that uh, the, the pandemic is going to highlight for America um, the, the real effects of the digital divide. Um, if you, people are used to using the internet at school or work and maybe they can say, I don't, you know, you don't really need it at home because you have it accessible to you in other places. But now we've taken that away um, uh, for health and safety. You, you have to be home right now and uh, you are totally dependent on your home internet. Clay, I'm gonna let you continue. Oh, I'm sorry, June, did you wanna jump in? I, I just wanted to underscore uh, Clay's remark. Um, Clay said he, he, at the risk of sounding callous, he thought this would highlight the digital divide. Um, my, my view on that is that I fully intend to use this as a battering ram with the federal government um, to get them to understand if they don't already, um, how this pandemic highlights the need to think about this critical infrastructure in the essential nature that it actually has, which is that it is essential and it needs to be treated as a matter of public policy and funding as necessary. That is something that the federal government has resisted uh, to this date. And I am, I, I can't say that I'm hopeful because uh, frankly, I don't know what it takes to get through to Washington DC, but I can say that the department is definitely turning up the volume on its advocacy in that direction. And in that sense, this crisis proves to be um, helpful. And I hope that doesn't sound callous. No, it's, not, it's it, you actually sound hopeful. You just don't sound optimistic. Um, but I, so I appreciate that. Well, you know, um, as a patriot, uh, as a patriot, I'm hopeful. Yeah. As a, as a realist looking at the immediate you know, past, um, it's, it gives me great consternation that there's even a question that the federal government would see it this way. But yeah. I think folks understand what I'm saying. Yeah, I do. Um, Clay, um, someplace I, I would like to lead you in terms of your testimony is that, um, and, and I listened in to some of the discussion in uh, the Senate Finance Committee yesterday, um, which is uh, some of, and, and actually I will also give the, the um, uh, Speaker Johnson credit for trying to focus our committees on things that we can do to address the immediate emergency issues before us as well as, um, as Commissioner Tierney was referring to, you know, never letting a good crisis go to waste, you know, hopefully that there are opportunities for us to shine a light on things that um, have a longer term uh, impact in, in terms of the work we're doing here. But um, what I heard in this, uh, you talking about in the Senate Finance Committee yesterday related to kind of uh, issues of availability um, and it's something that our committee and you have spoken about in our committee uh, with frequency in the last year, where are parts of the state where people, even if they wanted access, there is not access. They cannot access sufficient um, internet uh, speeds that allow them to kind of operate in the modern world. And that issue relative to um, uh, an issue of access related to things like affordability. Maybe you have a Comcast line or a fiber line going by your house, but you simply have a, a home that has school children living there that frankly can't afford the service. And to the extent the department has been able to uh, distinguish between, you know, an issue of availability relative to an issue of, um, you know, access related to affordability. Is that something that that, and I know we're early in this, but is that something that you've uh, been able to discern? Um, so as far as um, kind of affordability goes, that's kind of a hard question to answer as in who, uh, who does that affect? Um, there isn't a whole lot of good data nationally on that issue. 
Um, and I don't know that we have data on the state level on that. I, I think it's something that um, working with the Agency of Education that will want to pin down um, for students, especially, um, you know, uh, how what are the barriers to access and is price one of them? We do know a couple of things. Um, there is a disconnect, uh, apologize for the pun, between uh, folks who are eligible for Lifeline programs and folks that actually take advantage of the Lifeline, not, excuse me, not take advantage, but um, use the Lifeline program uh, to, um, uh, to get broadband service and get, or get telephone service. Um, and, you know, that's likely a result of efforts by the FCC um, uh, to um, cut down on waste, fraud, and abuse. It's an issue that they um, are concerned about with the Lifeline program. They've done some things over the years um, uh, to, to uh, verify uh, people's income and that kind of thing. Um, so we see, you know, in the state, and I think all states overall, that the number of people that would technically qualify for Lifeline is much higher than the number of people that actually use it. Um, and I, we don't know um, for every person who doesn't take advantage of it, whether it's um, uh, because they don't want to or because they can't because of some barrier. So um, that's certainly a, an area of inquiry, maybe um, um, looking at um, how we could uh, promote Lifeline better in the state um, might be uh, helpful. Um, I know the CDC does collect some data, so we'll look into that as well. Um, but in all likelihood, it's, it's an issue um, in Vermont like it is everywhere else. It's an issue, you know, that's in New York City or any, any major metropolitan area, but also in rural areas as well, so. Um, yeah, I, what, what I'll, I will interject, Clay, is um, I've spoken with Representative Webb, uh, who's the chair of the Education Committee, and we've spoken in recent days, and I have asked her to um, reach out to the Agency of Education to see if we can get better data quickly about um, the number of school children in the state who uh, to whom internet access would be available, um, but for issues of affordability. Um, and if there are children, uh, students who we can tie into remote learning that's available to them at their schools, but is not available to them because they live in a house that, um, again, for reasons of afford affordability does not have internet access. Um, in the last couple of days, I've reached out to all the, pres uh, all the principals um, in, in schools that I represent and just ask them, you know, give me a rough number. How many students do you have that uh, live in homes that cannot afford uh, internet access? And um, you know, I've, I've been getting back more anecdotal information, but I'm pressing them because I would like a number that we can react to is, you know, if we have a policy solution to that, um, that we can implement quickly, that is something that I would like to see you know, whether it's AOE, whether it's the department, whether it's something that we do through an emergency appropriations process that we, uh, or it's something we do working with providers uh, in, the, in the private sector, that that's something that we, uh, you know, rectify as, as soon as possible. But I just wanted to mention that. And I would encourage other people to reach out to your principals um, in, in your local schools to see how big of an issue is this in, in your local schools. Um, there's a couple of hands up and um, uh, Representative Campbell, I, I wanted to call on you if, if you still have a question. Sure, hi. <clears throat> what about leveraging the crisis for, uh, for cell phone service as well and wondering if, if, if that might be a, a way of getting at least some uh, internet service to uh, to, to people who have, no, who have none right now, as well as as well as uh, uh, broadening cell phone coverage, which is something else we need to do. Sorry. <laughs> yes, yeah, certainly. Wireless is a, a possible solution. I, I think that when you talk about availability, 
um, folks that don't have access to it because the, the facilities aren't there at their house. Um, you know, that's a, that's a longer term problem. I don't think it's one we should ignore or lose sight of, but, um, you know, if you started today to, to, to build something, um, you know, the, the construction would go through uh, what the projections are for the pandemic. Um, you know, with that said, uh, certainly we're uh, always looking for, um, for solutions to that problem and um well i guess if i may <clears throat> i think <clears throat> one of the things i was thinking about was not so much in the in the current um acute phase of the crisis but when we get it we get into recovery and we have when we, when we have some recovery money or stimulus money whatever you want to call it to to, to spend um how are we looking at teeing up uh, Using some of that money to expand our our um, cell phone network coverage. Well, we we certainly have the connectivity initiative, um, finding ways to get um, carriers uh, to um, uh, you know take connectivity initiative funding. Um, the dust, I don't think, is quite settled on the federal bill. Um, and so we're not clear yet what dollars can be used for what. There are those several um, uh, provisions that um, were added to the stimulus that uh, beef up uh, some of the existing federal broadband programs. Um, and there may be opportunities there. Um, there's a, a lot of money for telehealth and distance learning. Uh, for instance, that um, uh, may be able to tie into a wireless solution or uh, even a wired solution. Um, just going back to a uh, question or the comment um, by the, the chair, um, I, I did want to say that you know we are working with the Agency of Education and uh, we're, we're putting together a, a survey that um, that we hope will get some of that data. I don't know if it'll be, um, uh, you know, a complete data set, but it, it should be another data point that we can um, rely on to um, get a sense of, of what the affordability uh, or barrier to access uh, issue is like in the state. I appreciate that, Clay. Thank you, um, Mike. I don't want to put you on the spot, but I saw your hand come up. Uh, yeah, actually, what uh, Clay just said addressed the question that I had. Uh, that you know, folks. So you're all set. Yeah, pretty much, I guess. Uh, okay, just Ro Robin. To remark yep. that. Uh, just want to remark that folks have been advised to go to libraries and uh, school buildings, park in their car, and have the kids do their homework in their car, and I think that's uh, pretty kludgy and. Uh, um, you know, anything that can be done to help them get better access. Yeah, uh, certainly that's uh, been a criticism we're hearing. Um, we're not representing that our, our Wi-Fi hotspot map is a, the only solution here, but it's something that we could put together quickly. And uh, for people that really need the internet for one reason or the other, um, we want to let people know that they there are places they can go to get it still. Um, certainly no one wants to see children um, doing their homework uh, in their parents' car um, in the cold at night, but that is, that is an image um, of rural Vermont that, uh, that we've all seen well before the pandemic. Um, you know, that's, that's a way that a lot of rural Vermonters still access the internet and um, being able to go to the library is one thing, uh, but when you take that away, we wanted to make sure people knew that you can still get this service. So um, I've got two hands up. Uh, Robin, if you could go first and then Laura. Well, I also noticed June has been raising her hand and I don't know if she oh. wants to. 
comment on this before I ask my question? Sorry, sorry, June, you weren't on my screen. Go ahead. That's quite all right. We're all still learning. Uh, just briefly, I wanted to point out that, uh, as Clay said, uh, it's not like we're happy with the idea of folks going to hotspots, but um, it's important in a crisis situation to try to keep in mind chronology. And so those are actions that were taken in the early days to respond to immediate needs. Uh, some of the conversation we're having, as I'm sure you're aware, Chair Bricklin, um, talks more about the, um, the window going out and things that need to change. And so to that end, the point I'd like to make is increasingly, I don't draw a distinction between cell service and broadband. The need is for connectivity. And that is the, one of the points of advocacy that I intend to emphasize at the federal level when it comes to funding. Um, I, I understood that uh, Speaker Pelosi um, intends to bring another uh, stimulus package before the federal Congress. And uh, one of the highlighted items in there is infrastructure. So I'm quite sure we haven't seen the last of movement in that area. And I think it will speak to uh, these issues that we're talking about because the crisis is highlighting that this infrastructure is necessary and it's inadequate. But from the department's perspective, none of it's accept acceptable. The issue is funding, funding, and more funding. And so data collection is definitely a priority in terms of finding out where the students are who um, have affordability issues. It's one of the things that has become manifest through the crisis because now we have the government directing people to stay home. 